Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this first in-person meeting of Transport for the North Board. I say first, it's the first since, I think, March 2020. So it's uh, lovely to see you all in person today. We're all very socially distanced, which is good. Um, I'd also like to welcome anybody who might be watching this on the live streaming. My name's Louise Gittins. I'm a councillor. Uh, for Cheshire West and Chester. I'm leader of the council and I re represent a lovely place called Little Neston and Ness. Um, I'm here as acting chair of Transport for the North um, and I'll be holding, hopefully holding this position until we recruit a new chair early next year. Um, I thought we have got some new people here today, so I thought it'd be a good idea if everybody could go around and just say who they are um, so that everybody knows who everyone is, because I know when my first meeting it was a little bit confusing and didn't have a clue who anyone was, so that will help. Um, so if I can start with officers, please, on this side, and then we'll, we'll work our way round the room. Uh, good morning. Um, Stephen Hipwell, Head of HR at CFN. Good morning, Chris Melling, Chair of the uh, Audit and Governance Committee. Hi, I'm Ian Craven, I'm the TFM Finance Director. Good morning, I'm Paul Kelly, the Financial Controller at TFN. Good morning, I'm Julie Openshaw, the Head of Legal for TFN and Monitoring Officer. Good morning everyone, uh, Ben Smith, I'm the Director of Region, Cities and Devolution at the Department for Transport. Uh, good morning, colleagues. County Councillor Keith Little, representing Cumbria. Good morning, everyone. Councillor Craig Brown, Deputy Leader of Cheshire East Council. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Councillor Charlotte Cupid, representing Derbyshire. Good morning. Charlie Edwards, representing Lancashire County Council. Probably the only person in the room with a 26 to 30 rail card. Uh, looking forward to meeting you all. Good morning, Councillor Heather Scott, leader of Darlington Bury Council, but here representing Tees Valley Combined Authority. Uh, Martin Gannon, leader of Gateshead Council, representing North East Combined Authority, and definitely not the only person with a senior rail card, but only recently acquired. Jamie Driscoll, North of Tyne Mayor, representing the North of Tyne Combined Authority. Good morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Liam Robinson from Liverpool, and I'm alternating for our Mayor, Steve Rodham. Don McKenzie, Executive Member, North Yorkshire County Council. Good morning. I'm Darren Hale. I'm the leader of Hull City Council. Uh, good morning. I'm Councillor Richard Hannigan, Deputy Leader of North Lincolnshire Council. Morning, Dave Stones from National Highways. I'm standing in for Nick Harris, who's hosting our staff conference today. So. Peter Kennan from South Yorkshire, Mayoral Combined Authority, LEP. I've just renewed my senior rail card. Uh, good morning, uh, Mark Rostron, Lancashire, LEP. Morning, Matthew Lamb, North Yorkshire, LEP. Hi, Councillor Hans Mondry representing Warrington. Uh, and I'm Martin Tugwell, uh, Chief Executive of Transport for the North. Uh, super. So I think that's everybody. And um, Councillor Edwards, just to say, I don't have any sort of rail card. I just missed out on the young person's one. So, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so just uh, a few words about the housekeeping. Um, if you uh, want to speak, if you can put your hand up, but don't press the red button until I introduce you to speak, only because there's a, a roaming camera somewhere that if you press the red button while someone else is speaking, it will focus on you. So that's a very important bit of housekeeping. Um, okay, so I understand from the monitoring offer we are quarret. Julie, is that correct? Yes, I'm happy to say so, Chairman. Excellent. Um, so do we have apologies for absence today, please? Julie, can you just, uh, apologies for absence? Um, David Sidebottom is the only one I'm aware of, Chairman. That's great. I'm conscious there is a conference in Brighton today, so I think some members might be at that. 
Um, okay, uh, next item, item number two is declarations of interest. Members, does anybody have anything they want to declare in relation to any of the items on the agenda today? Okay, that's fine. Uh, thank you. If we move on now to item number three, which is minutes of the previous meetings and chief executives consultation calls. So the last TFM board meeting we had was an online meeting on the 16th of April. Um, since then, we, we haven't been able to have formal meetings online, so this is why this is the first proper TFM board meeting. But we did have a chief exec's consultation call on the 9th of June and the 27th of July. So the minutes are at um, section three. Has anybody got any, um, anything they want to raise under those? Or I think most updates should be covered during the agenda today. Um, if you... Note the consultation call on the 27th of July. I think our att the attendance list is incorrect on it. So um, if anybody was at that meeting and they're not on the list or they weren't at the meeting and they're on the list, can you let us know now? And that's on page 17. No? Okay. So are we happy to approve the minutes? Could I have a proposer, please? Hands at Councillor Mundy. Thank you. Seconder? C Councillor Brown, thank you. Okay, so there, everyone in favour? Yes, good, so they're carried. Um, the item number four is the governance report, and this is a report that covers um, a number of constitutional and governance issues, and I will ask um, our head of legal um, to present the report. Julie Openshaw, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. This report, as you say, covers a number of diverse constitutional and governance issues, and the purpose of the report is set out at section one with the recommendations at paragraphs 2.1 to 2.9. The first issue contained in 2.1 to 2.3 is the election of chair and vice chairs, and I would respectfully suggest that this is done at the outset, after which I will then remain, uh, outline the remaining matters that are in the report. At present, unless there are any further nominations received today, Councillor Gittins is the only nominee following from the previous meeting. And the recommendation is that unless there are any other, recommend, uh, any other nominations received, Councillor Gittins' nomination be approved and that she be elected chair for the forthcoming year or until such time as an independent chair is appointed. For this item, in the absence of the minority vice chair today, a temporary chair will be required to preside over this item and I therefore invite a nominee to be agreed as temporary chair to do this. Could I um, ask that we have uh, Councillor Little to be the temporary chair as the vice chair of audit and governance? I'd like to propose that. Anybody okay? Everyone okay with that? Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as it, uh, it's been uh, indicated, colleagues, uh, Louise can take the chair. She was appointed at the last meeting, but uh, we, we need, just for clarity, um, to, I would like to uh, nominate uh, Councillor Gittins to be the chair of not only this meeting, but also the meeting that will take place this afternoon, which is the partnership board meeting. Uh, if somebody could second that. Is there any other nominations, colleagues? In that case, can I welcome you, Madam Chair, to the, uh, uh, to the post, and uh, thank you. Could I also then, colleagues, move on to the uh, nomination for the Majority Vice Chair, which uh, Councillor uh, also holds at the moment, uh, but we need to uh, do that one as well. And again, I'm happy to, second, to nominate Louise for that role. Can I have a seconder? Can that be agreed? Are there any other nominations for Majority Vice Chair? No? Thank you. I'll hand back to you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you very much. So I understand we now have to appoint a Minority Vice Chair. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. So do we have any nominations for a Minority Vice Chair? 
Can I suggest, if we don't, that this item is deferred to the next meeting, and then um, that can be decided, and we'll agree it at the next meeting. Is everyone okay with that? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Julie, do you want to continue with the report? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, so the next item is the recommendation to board that Graham Bell be appointed as the fourth independent member of Audit and Governance Committee. And as you will recall, and as reported, board previously resolved to have an additional independent member seat on the Audit and Governance Committee in order to allow for a simpler turnover of members and avoid uh, a loss of vital expertise all at one time. So a, re a robust public recruitment process has been carried out to fill this role. And after interviews, Mr. Bell is recommended for appointment and his CV is uh, appended to the report. The next matter is for the appointment of two further board members to the two vacancies on Audit and Governance Committee and also to approve the membership of board and other committees as set out in Appendix 2, including the General Purposes Committee. Uh, the Audit and Governance Committee uh, consisted of eight members, now nine, including Mr. Bell, assuming that that is approved, of whom four are independent members, and the remainder of five are drawn from the board. The loss of two board members following last year's elections means that only three of the five seats are currently filled, giving rise to difficulties around quorum, as the quorum is three of whom at least two have to be board members. That can include constituent authority members, but can also include other co-opted members on, on board. Um, I understand that there is one potential nominee to these two positions, but ideally, and to avoid having to defer until the next meeting, um, it would be uh, preferable if board could make both appointments today, because it is important that those two vacancies are filled. Likewise, General Purposes Committee can only be called and begin its work when members have been appointed. Thus far, I am aware only of two potential nominations. Uh, again, I hope that nominations can be put forward and considered and those positions filled today. The next matter for approval um, is the approval of the Constitution subject to the changes in Appendices 3, 4 and 5. Appendix 3 reflects the decision to increase the number of independent members on audit and governance from 3 to 4 and also puts forward a recommendation from the member working group that GPC should have on it a LEP member as well as the existing membership. Again, also stemming from the uh, members working group recommendation, there's a recommendation uh, to add to the procedure rules to allow for members to be able to part participate in future virtually in meetings, subject to officers being able to put in the required technology and practical arrangements to allow this, which is still under careful consideration by officers from a logistical point of view. It does need to be noted, um, as has been said before, that such access to meetings would not legally be able to allow members to be accounted for quorum purposes or to cast a vote if a vote was required. Um, voting matrix at Appendix 4 is also recommended to be a replacement for the current version. That has been recalculated based on the relevant population figures as required on a two-yearly basis, and it means that one extra vote will in future be due to the, uh, the new South Yorkshire Mayoral Combined Authority, formerly the Sheffield City Region, and to Greater Manchester Combined Authority, which will take the total from 86 uh, to 88 votes altogether. Uh, the new the new name for the South Yorkshire Merrill Combined Authority is also to be reflected throughout the Constitution where relevant, and there's a recommendation that the Partnership Board Terms of Reference be updated to uh, remove the current bar on the new independent chair having been a local authority member in the TFN region uh, during the last five years, as recommended by Member Working Group, and also to suspend the requirement for the Partnership Board Chair to be an independent chair and to be the same person who chairs board until such time as a new independent chair can be appointed. Uh, the next matter is also to update the Officer Code of Conduct as shown in the, in the Constitution. Um, it came to light recently that the version currently shown is marginally difficult, uh, different to that which was approved by the trade unions following consultation from Human Resources, so the latter is in fact the correct version. And in order to correct the inconsistency, the recommendation is to replace the current version in the published constitution with the document which the unions were consulted on and approved. And the final matter, Chair, is to approve the annual calendar of meetings for the forthcoming year, as is required by the constitution. 
It's recognised that given the current fluid circumstances, changes may need to be made to some of these dates as the year progresses, with agreement, of course, with chairs. But this provides a template for TFN's future business over the next 12 months and will fulfil the constitutional requirement for a calendar of meetings to be set at the annual meeting. Uh, I would suggest, Chair, that unless members have any objection or questions to any of those items, that the recommendations in 2.4 to 2.9 are moved and dealt with on block. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much um, for a very comprehensive overview of quite a complicated number of issues. Um, I think, uh, has anybody got any comments? I'd, if, I think what I'd probably like to do is just take them in order of the um, points that are there so that we don't sort of go all over the place. So I think in terms of the recommendations, 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3 have been covered. 2.4 is the appointing Graham Bell as the fourth independent member of the Audit and Governance Committee. Does anyone want to comment on that? Yes, Councillor Edwards. Uh, I actually, um, thanks to that report, uh, it's given me a bit of time to have a little think. And I just wanted to actually go back to point 2.3. Point um, I think it's actually really important that this organisation is cross-party in everything it does. And I think it's a bit of a shame to not have uh, the position of minority vice chair filled. There's been no communication um, between the Conservative representatives about who should fill that vacancy. Um, I think it's really important that we do have that vacancy filled. So I'm asking colleagues right now, um, I'm very happy to put myself forward for, for, the, for the position. I think it's really important that we fill it and I think that we operate on a cross-party basis and that every political organisation is represented at the top table of TFN. I'd be grateful if com colleagues can would support that and nominate me. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Edwards, and that, that is why we've got two vice chairs. So um, do we have a, a proposer then for Councillor Edwards? Okay, we've got two proposers there, that's great. And a seconder, so between you, yeah. uh, Councillor McKenzie, yes, okay. And uh, those in favour, everyone happy with that? Yep, okay, that's clearly uh, carried. And uh, congratulations and welcome to the team. Um, okay, so if we go back to 2.4, which is Graham Bell as the fourth independent member of the Audit and Governance Committee. Anyone got any issues on that they want to raise? Okay, um, and then if we go on to the um, additional members of the Audit and Governance Committee. Now, Councillor Mundy has very kindly uh, nominated himself for that. Is it, it's, we do need someone else. Councillor Little, are you going to sell the, how great the Audit and Governance is and why we need someone else on it? Uh, I would just like to second Councillor Mundy and welcome him to the uh, Audit and Assurance Committee. It is a very important committee uh, and it needs to meet under correct terms. Thank you. So um, if, if nobody wants to put the hand up now, if you can have a little think about it and let us know, that would be uh, great. And the same goes for the General Purposes Committee as well. Um, so it, they're not onerous time-wise, these. They are, you know, it's not every week or it's uh, a few times a year. And it, they are really important um, committees to ensure that members' voices are heard. So please consider yourself, have a think about it and consider yourselves. Um, okay, so the, um, the next one is uh, membership of the board and of the committee's appendix two. Councillor Hale. Um, certainly both ourselves in Hull and the East Riding would not be happy with the Rail North Committee uh, um, representatives to be approved. We'd ask that they be left vacant um, at this stage because we have agendered this at the Humber Unitary Leaders Authority. There has not been a vote for five years as to who should represent the Humber. And uh, what this has meant was both ourselves and the East Riding um, have effectively have no consultation over some of the proposals to change train services in our area, which I will come to later. And there's enormous disquiet at the decimation of some services in the East Riding and Hull and we've not been consulted formally as local authorities on that at all because it goes through this forum. Now it's not in any way a criticism of our colleagues from North Lincolnshire but what I will say was we did write to TFN um, Hull and the East Riding and ask that as clearly our South Bank authorities have no interest in a devolution partnership with ourselves on the North Bank whether 
we should have separate representation on the North Rail North Committee, and we're told that couldn't happen. I'm still at a loss as to why that can't happen. I would ask that um, I'd be happier if that was left vacant, but in the meantime, there could be a governance review as to why the South Bank can't have a representative and we can't, when there's no prospect of there ever being a devolution deal across the Humber. More's the pity in my view, but that's a separate issue. That wasn't our decision. So I'm asking um, perhaps uh, the person responsible for governance why we can't have a South and a North Bank representative. Um, but failing that, I'm asking that's left because th what, what is the um, Humber Leaders Group that doesn't meet really? It meets, hasn't met for six months, but we'll, we've called a meeting in October and we've asked that this be agendered. Um, but you're asking a body that doesn't really have any formal basis to, 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 to appoint to this body when we, we have no skin in the game anymore. Even the LEP, the Humber LEP's been dissolved and we now have a Hull in East Yorkshire LEP and the South Bank authorities are with a different LEP. So um, I'm asking for some clarity, Chair, as to whether the simpler thing would be that there could be a place for both the North Bank and the South Bank, but if not, that that be left vacant at this stage. Um, and as I say, it's not, it's not, this isn't out the blue because we did give notice and write. And just to add, add to the point that it's not a political point because ourselves and um, um, obviously the East Riding is a conservative run authority, we're a Labour run authority, but we are, we are at one on this point. Thank you uh, very much, Councillor Hale, and I, re I do understand where you're coming from, and to me a sensible solution would be to take it away and review um, that um, and perhaps come back to the next board meeting. Uh, Julie, is that something that we can do? Uh, yes, indeed, Chair. Thank you very much. So, um, moving on uh, with our bullet points here. Um, so, there's the uh, membership. So yes, Councillor Driscoll. Mayor Driscoll. Sorry, Mayor Driscoll. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fight a big election to be called Councillor. No, um, the, it says there will need to be amended the Rail, Rail North Committee members. It's just, um, I think it's got me and Martin the wrong way around, that's all. Okay, Thank so you. can we amend that, please? That would be great. Anything else on the committees? No? Okay, thank lead. you very much. And um, then we have the um, 2.7, which is, uh, we've gone through those. Uh, Appendix four is the changing of the wording, um, which seems to make sense, and replacement of the officer code of conduct. Um, to, with the correct version, which also makes sense to me. Anybody got any issues with those? Okay, uh, 2.8, um, that the requirement for the independent chair of the partnership board be waived until further notice. Um, so we're happy with that one as well. Okay, and the calendar of meetings with the flexibility to, oh, sorry, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair, it's in relation to, to 2.8. Um, Firstly, I welcome the working group's recognition of the importance of uh, having an independent person as, uh, as a chair of uh, both the board and the partnership board. But I have a couple of questions. Uh, at section 3.18 on page 35 of the report, it states that uh, this will not be possible for the period during which a new chair is being recruited. And I just wondered, firstly, how do we know that, given that the panel members haven't yet assessed the applications that have come forward? And then secondly, the report goes on to say, or to recommend, that the requirement for um, an independent chair is waived until a new independent chair can be appointed. My reading of that wording suggests that we are seeking to appoint an interim chair but that's not reflected in the wording of the report under item five, which suggests we're appointing to a four-year term. Could I just have some clarity on those two points, please? Julie, can you clarify? My understanding is that whilst we're recruiting for an independent chair for the board and for the partnership board, that um, we waive the uh, requirement to have an independent chair of the partnership board and for the acting chair of 
the part of the board to take on that role in the interim period. That's my understanding. Is that correct, Julie? That's correct, Chair, yes. Okay. Does that clar clarify it? Okay. Thanks. So, uh, just going back to my bullet. Sorry, my uh, mouse is a bit slow this morning. Uh, so that is 2.8, 2.9 calendar of meetings. So we're all happy. Oh, Councillor Scott. Thank you. I've, I've, I've got no objection to the calendar of meetings, but can we look at the venues, please? I did raise it at the last meeting, and I mean, I am uh, part of the audit board, and one of the reasons that we had problems last time was because it was in Manchester. And it's not that easy for us to get here. I only made it in time this morning. Um, and I think uh, Meg Driscoll did say, you know, Newcastle would be a good venue, Darlington would be a good venue, but please, if you could just consider that, because it's not easy for everybody to get to Manchester. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And living almost on the Welsh border, nowhere, nowhere's easy to get to uh, from where I am. So I think we do need to look at the venues and also the start times as well, so that there's plenty of time for people to get to the, the meetings. And maybe that's something that we could take away and have a look at in terms of the venues and make sure that they're accessible for everybody. Um, obviously, in the rosy future, when we can have proper hybrid meetings where people are, uh, I hope, allowed to vote, that will make it much easier. But for now, if we do have hybrid, there is you can't vote in the meeting. That's my understanding. But yes, we will try and make them accessible as possible. Councillor Scott, thank you. Um, so is everybody... Julie, sorry. Sorry, Chair, I, I just wanted to add, I don't, don't want to obviously pr prolong the matter, but just before you leave this particular um, item, on, on 3.6, going back to the membership of the General Purposes Committee, um, at, at present there are no nominees for any of those. I understood that there was one. If, if I'm incorrect, then so be it, but I, understand that the, I understood that there was one nominee for General Purposes Committee. I understand that there will be a number of other um, posts on the General Purposes Committee that won't be filled today, but I understood that there was one at least. So we have one no nominee for the General Purposes Committee. Peter? Um, thank you, Chair. Following the agreement that LEP me members could join General Purposes Committee, I did put my name forward to join that, so I didn't know whether that was the one or whether that was not the one. There was actually that one, Chair, and a, and a member as well, but as I say, I may be wrong. Okay, so is there a member who wants to be nominated to be on the General Purposes Committee or is nominating somebody else? Councillor Robinson? Just for clarity, I, I might be that member that you already been mentioned because the Liverpool City Regions agreed that I'm gonna sit on the General Purposes Committee from, from our perspective. So if we have Councillor uh, Robinson nominated. Is everyone happy with that nomination that he goes? Yes. Okay. Great. Good. I think we've got there now. And if anybody else wants to be on the General Purposes Committee, please can you uh, let us know? That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. So, item two. We often. Anybody else want to speak on anything? Sorry, on item uh, four on the governance report, and we will move on to um, some other matters. Okay, so um, item five is the recruitment of the Transport for the North uh, Board and Partnership Board Chair. Um, so can I ask one of the officers to introduce this, please? Stephen, thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, as set out in the paper, the governance uh, members working group have uh, worked up the, uh, the approach and endorsed the recommendations in this report. Um, I, I just intend this morning to take the paper as read and look to briefly take members through each of the recommendations for approval in turn. Um, the first, first matter for approval um, is in relation to the recommendation of the appointment of a single chair as set out in point 3.2 of the paper. There is the, op the option for the appointment of a chair for both uh, the partnership board and for the TFM board. However, as set out in the paper, the recommendation for the reasons set out is that we look to appoint a single chair to undertake both roles. So that's the first point for approval. 
So uh, should we take them one at a time then, Stephen? Yeah, okay. So is everybody happy with that? Agreed, okay, thank you. Next point. Okay, the, the next point um, is set out at point f uh, 3.3 .3 of the report is the recommendation that members approve the constitutional change uh, around the current preclusion of um, previously elected members um, from the North who've been previously held an elected role um, in the last five years from being able to apply for the role of TFN chair. Thank you, uh, Stephen. And uh, as I was on the um, committee when we were, were going through these recommendations, I think we felt that we needed to have as strong a pool as possible for the chair, and we didn't want to exclude anybody from that because of the political um, position in the last five years. Um, so that was the reason that we put that there. So is everyone happy with that? Okay, thank you. The next point for consideration is the proposed role profile um, for the position of TFN chair and the remuneration that uh, accompanies the role. A proposed role profile, which has been worked up in consultation with the members working group, is detailed at appendix one of the report for approval, and that will form the basis of the recruitment process. The members working group have also considered that the time needed to carry out the role, to reasonably carry out the role, um, would benefit from an increase in the number of days assigned to the role from 45 days per annum to 60 days per annum and obviously an increase in the salary commensurate with the increase in the number of days. Anybody got any comments or on observations on that? We felt that the, whoever it was needed to really just get on with it and spend a lot of time and effort so we, we thought we needed to increase both the days and the salary. So everyone okay? Yes, good. Next. Uh, the, the final points uh, for approval um, are effectively are in relation to the proposed terms of reference um, for um, the uh, proposed appointment panel who would lead the uh, recruitment process. It is proposed that a similar terms of reference to those that were utilised for the successful recent recruitment process for the TFN CEO um, are adopted and they are set out at Appendix um, 2 of the report um, for approval. Um, you will also note that uh, in advance of today's meeting, nominations for individuals to sit on that appointment panel have been sought and again are set out in the terms of reference for approval. Everyone okay with those? Yes? Okay, agreed. Thank you. I think, Chair, that covers all the, the points for approval, obviously, to note that we'll look to commence um, the recruitment um, programme, um, obviously, shortly following today's meeting, and we're looking for that to commence week commencing the 11th of October. Thank you, Stephen. And the, the actual um, timetable is, is in the report as well. So hopefully in January meeting, we will have a new chair. So fingers crossed on that. And if anybody's watching who might be interested, then um, please put your name in the ring. Thank you. Um, so, um, that's uh, papers clearly carried. So, if we um, move on to item number six, which is the annual governance statement, statement of accounts approval, and the audit opinion. And I'm going to ask um, Paul Kelly to introduce this. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the purpose of the report is essentially to uh, approve the annual governance statement, which is captured in the, in the papers, and the annual statement of accounts. And and also referencing the process that TFN management, the external auditors and the Audit and Governance Committee have followed during the year. The statutory deadline for publishing the accounts is tomorrow. Um, and this, was, um, this was extended for this year and for next year, um, but uh, is anticipated re to revert to the normal date of the 31st of July in the year ending March 23. The annual governance statement is captured in pages 61 to 77 of, of your papers. It's part of the statutory accounts and um, it's, it's, it has to be approved. The actual governance statement itself is to be approved specifically as a standalone item and it has its own recommendation within the report. Essentially, in terms of the process that we followed, there's, there's an internal process, the ex external order and, and the scrutiny by the Audit and Go Governance Committee. The accounts were published for public inspection on the 7th of July and no inquiries were received. 
Um, the accounts were audited by our external auditors, Mazars, and they advised a clean audit report will be issued. Um, the audit completion report is, is captured in Appendix 6.3b. The draft accounts have been presented to and challenged by the Audit and Governance Committee on a number of occasions, and they have advised at the last meeting that they are comfortable that the accounts are considered for approval at this meeting. Subject to the Board approving the accounts, um, they will be sent to Mazars, who will sign their audit report tomorrow, and they will be then published on, on our website uh, tomorrow uh, before close of play. An integral part of the, of the process, as mentioned before, was the role of the Audit and Governance Committee. And if I could introduce the Chair of the Audit and Governance Committee, Chris Melling, to take us through the, um, their annual report. Thank you. Okay, um, if we uh, just look through the purpose of the report first, uh, the report updates the Transport uh, Board on the work undertaken uh, by the Audit and Governance Committee over the last year. The report provides a summary on the committee's activity against its terms of reference and its findings against its areas of scrutiny, and the report also concludes with a recommendation for the board. Um, just uh, moving on, the TFN constitution prescribes the requirement for an audit and governance committee. Uh, the committee is comprised of five members of the TFN board, as we've discussed earlier, and um, we've just increased the number of independent members now to four. Uh, the committee's terms of reference are appended to this report for reference, but the committee's principal purpose is to provide independent review and assurance to members on governance, risk management, and control frameworks. During uh, 2021 financial year, the committee met five times, and that's for those people uh, interested who may well wish to join the committee, uh, it's five times a year. Um, these meetings last year were remote, um, taking advantage of the short-term COVID leg legislation that did not require them to be in person. Turning to the um, audit and governance uh, work plan, over the year, the committee has agreed a number of standing items that should be brought uh, before the committee by officers. These include the corporate risk register, financial reporting and constitution reviews, and in addition, relevant monthly operating report is provided to the committee for consideration. In addition to this, the committee also approved the internal audit program of activity. Um, this programme has been designed to provide the committee with assurance that it requires that TFN has implemented a control framework that appropriately manages risk. The committee has received regular updates from internal audit against this plan and also updates from external audit as they have progressed the statutory audits. The committee's activity vis-a-vis uh, -vis its terms of reference is presented in the matrix form in appendix uh, at the back of the report. Um, RSM was, report, was appointed as the internal auditor back in 2018. Um, RSM, the internal auditor, uh, was able to provide the committee uh, with a level of assurance in, in the areas that they reviewed. In addition to reviewing uh, those areas, uh, the uh, internal audit uh, follow-up on previous internal uh, audit uh, functions and they are able to uh, give the committee uh, good progress in relation to follow-up. Committee is also able to provide the, the board with the assurance from these reports that the necessary core controls expected of a public body have been implemented in the areas reviewed. With regard to external audit, um, Mazars conducted the external audit, as, as previously mentioned, um, as required by statute. This audit considers whether the statement of accounts presents a true and fair view of TFN's affairs. The committee has received progress reports from officers and Mazars throughout the year regarding progress in relation to the completion of the accounts and their subsequent audit has reviewed the draft accounts three times through the finance director's consultation calls, which essentially was the meetings of the internal audit committee. Uh, whilst external auditors will not formally report their audit findings until the release of the ISA 260 audit opinion to the TFM board, I can say that the committee has sufficient comfort to recommend the accounts to the board uh, for approval. Uh, 
During the year, the committee has reviewed both corporate and risk pro, uh, uh, programmes and provided feedback uh, with regard to presentation of the information provided. Uh, moving forward, uh, the work programme for uh, the committee is set out in paragraph 3.24, and also the internal audit plan for 21-22 is set out in 3.25. In conclusion, having reviewed the findings of the internal audit and the submissions of the officers, the committee can provide assurance to the board that in the areas reviewed, TFN has implemented a sound control framework that appropriately manages risk. Having reviewed the statement of accounts and received representation from officers and external audit, the committee members recommend to the board the approval of the statement of accounts as contained in this pack. So just uh, finally, the recommendations. The members of the Audit and Governance Committee have indicated that they are content for the board to approve the Corporate Governance Review and the Annual Governance Statement. The members of the Audit and Governance Committee have indicated that they are content for the board to note the recommendation in the Annual Progress Report of the Audit and Governance Committee to approve the Statement of Accounts for 2021. The members of the Audit and Governance Committee have indicated that they are content for the Board to approve the Statement of Accounts for Financial Year 2020-21. Thank you. And, and thank you, Chris, for those reassurances, and thank you for all the work that you've done as the Independent Chair of Audit and Governance Committee. Uh, Councillor Little, did you want to add some comment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I also would like to add my thanks not only to Chris, uh, who does a sterling job in keeping the committee uh, and the officers to account, but also to the officers that support this committee. Uh, as a lot of work goes into it, and it has been a very difficult time. As Chris has outlined, the internal audit and external uh, audit uh, officers have given us the assurances, uh, and it has been difficult because we have been working over teams. But I would also like to support the recommendations at uh, Agenda Item 5. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Little. Uh, would anyone else like to make any comments on this item? No? OK. So if we go to the recommendations, we need to go through them one at a time and approve each one. So the first one, it's recommended that the board approve the corporate governance review and the annual governance statement. Is everyone happy with those? that yes agreed uh, 2.2 it is recommended that the board notes the recommendation in the annual progress report of the audit and governance committee to approve the statement of accounts for 2020 21 everyone happy is that agreed agreed thank you and 2.3 it is recommended that the board approve the statement of accounts for the financial year 2020 21 is that agreed Thank you very much. And that means that all three recommendations have been approved and we can uh, sign the accounts after the meeting. Thank you. So moving on to item number seven, which is suspending review submission. Could I ask um, Ian Craven, are you introducing this one? Okay, thanks. Uh, if I may, Chairman, I'll, I'll start off and then uh, invite Ian to just say a few other words. Um, you have the, uh, the report before you. You have the letter that we submitted um, to the department ahead of the, uh, what the internal deadline that the department had to get their submissions across as part of the spending review. I think the thing to point out here to members is that the focus of the submission was very much on what we need to achieve in the next three years. This is on the backdrop, backdrop of, um, in conversation with the department, we know that the department understand that for subnational transport bodies, having multi-year funding settlements gives us greater certainty, allows us to achieve efficiencies in terms of how we plan for work, and uh, that's the basis on which the submission was made uh, this year. Um, the submission itself, um, we will then use to develop the three-year uh, view vision of what we will be doing as Transport for the North, and we will be bringing that back, Chair, to your next meeting in November for members to debate. Um, it's also worth mentioning to members that uh, there's increasing liaison between um, not only ourselves as Transport for the North, but all the subnational transport bodies with 
uh, the department, and that's being led very much by the Director General, Emma Ward, who I know from those conversations is very supportive of the work the STBs are doing and is very keen to see that the work that STBs are doing is, is better understood within the department, I think it would be fair to say, because it is one of those things with, with silos within departments. It's not always obvious. But one of our great advantages is the ability to look across the individual transport modes. And, and really, just to sort of build on that, uh, it's just to make members aware that at the moment we are uh, working with the department to uh, see if we can access some additional in-year funding uh, which could help us in the areas of capacity and capability, uh, EV infrastructure uh, and, uh, and uh, decarbonisation, which are all priorities for us as TFN. So I think, uh, Chair, I think that's what, for me, that gives a sense that there is a real understanding, if you like, of this source of expertise, knowledge and experience that we have at TFN, and that's been reflected in the, uh, the submission. But if I might invite Ian just to comment on the, uh, the financial side of the submission. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'll be quite brief on this. Broadly, um, I think members will recognise that the, the financial asset that's in there is, is, is in line with last year. Um, we did consider quite strongly the balance between ambition and being alive to the messages that we're getting back from the department and from government regarding um, the overall financial situation. Um, I think the funding that we have requested will, will allow us to deliver the, the plan that is set out in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the CSR. I think there is one thing that's just worth drawing to people's attention. Anybody who's compared between this year's and last year's um, CSR ask will notice that there's, well, there seems to be quite a significant drop in the NPR ask. Um, that is largely a, a technical matter. Last year's CDEL CSR was a four-year plan. This year's is a three-year plan. And with the delay, there's been a year's delay to the program due to IRP delays. And as a result, the last year of the four-year CDEL has dropped out of the back of this year's submission. So if, if this year's submission were to be extended for another year, it would be back aligned with what we've um, what we'd said previously. So there's, there's been no diminution of ambition on NPR. It's just as a technical reason why the, the overall ask has declined. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Martin. Does anybody want to add any comments or make any observations? Hans, Peter? All right, we'll go. C Councillor Mundy first. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I think we, we, we can't underestimate, I think, uh, the importance of having the ambition to deliver what's needed in the north of, of, of the country. But also, that's got to come hand in hand with the finances to achieve what, what you're setting out there. So, I think the importance of having a regular funding stream, knowing what that fund is in advance, allows you to tailor what you're trying to deliver for the North and, and use resources in the best and efficient way. So I think it's important that we, we actually receive what we need and we have the, uh, the timely announcements of, of saying we've got some security if we've got the funding to deliver what is what's needed. Thank you, Councillor Mundy. A very important point there that you've raised. Uh, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're, we're faced with what could be quite a brutal spending review, and um, I note in the paper um, that we are going to uh, have further opportunities to engage with government in advance of the deadline. Um, what didn't shine through to me in the submission uh, was what is special about TFN and our USPs. Uh, the fact that we are elected members and business representatives, we are one north, We've got great analytical tools and research, and we've, we, we can drive up benefit, and we can drive out cost of major projects. And we have a new CEO um, with a reinvigoration of our agenda. So I really hope that, that we can take the next few weeks to get not only to government, but a public message out about why we're here. Because if this is going to be brutal, we need to be right up there. Thank you, Peter. And yes, uh, I, I agree with everything you've said there, really important. And it is that we are One North. I think that's really important. And we've got a lot to offer. And really being clear about that USP is important and a challenge for our chief exec and the team here at TFN, but us working together because we are one team, One North. Uh, Councillor Robinson. 
Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Three specific points from, from ourselves, uh, really, because this is a, a good submission, but there's a few points of detail that we wanted to pick up. Um, from the Liverpool City Region's perspective, we're a little bit disappointed that where it's referenced on page 231 about the need to prioritise investment in key station hubs, that a Liverpool station solution isn't referenced there alongside Leeds, Sheffield and Manchester, not least because... Liverpool Lime Street is not fit for purpose for any of the kind of NPR and HS2 uh, solutions. And obviously it would be a classic compatible uh, solution, but that's exactly the same as, as Sheffield uh, as well. So we'd hope that in our final submissions that uh, a station solution for Liverpool is part of, of that kind of uh, submission. The second point of detail we wanted to raise uh, really kind of refers to points on page 233. Uh, it's 0.5.4. Um, just in terms of how we're pulling together our updated uh, investment programme for 2023 to influence uh, things like CP7, uh, I think from our perspective, we were just conscious that CP7 will kick in in 2024. Is 2023 too late to try to influence the rail industry? So do we need to kind of invigorate that and bring that kind of updating forward earlier to make sure CP7 can be as ambitious for the north of England as, as possible? And the third point really is, is just about how we make sure that we keep on you know, knocking down those silos in government, as, as Martin quite rightfully uh, acknowledged, because absolutely great that TFN is doing uh, what we're doing, engaging with government and sort of similar uh, sub-transport, um, sub-national transport bodies, but equally all the combined authorities and all of the different areas uh, across our area I know are equally engaging vigorously with the CSR process. So how are we making sure that, to put it crudely, we're tag-teaming on this, that TFN is kind of championing lots of key asks of each of the constituent areas and by the same extension, each of the constituent areas are championing some of those big transformational pan-northern projects that TFN is leading on as well, just to make sure we maximise that impact of a CSR that delivers for all of our areas and the north as a whole. So those are the three yeah, key points we wanted to raise. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Did you want to respond to that, Martin? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and just responding, though, so um, I totally agree with the point being made by Councillor Robinson about the importance of recognising where we've got this investment in major station upgrades like Liverpool Lime Street. And, and as you as quite rightly said, it's not just there, it's Manchester Piccadilly, it's Bradford, it's Leeds, it's all across the region. I'm really keen that we emphasise this is economic regeneration investment. Transport is an enabler. And I think um, what I would very much hope we can do with the board as we move forward over the next few months is draw out the economic benefits of this, because I think as Peter Kennan has pointed out in his contribution, this is about investing in the North to deliver sustainable economic growth. And I think in the strategic transport plan, we've got the foundations for that. We launched the Northern Transport Charter at our conference last week, which is in effect our offer to government about how we can work together to deliver that potential. And I think that's something I'm really keen to work with uh, the board over the, over the coming months. On the specific issue about um, uh, the, the various five-year spend, spending, uh, spending uh, cycles, we've got a very good and very strong working relationship with Network Rail and indeed with um, National Highways, the, the rebranded Highways England. And we are, you know, the conversations we're having on a regular basis, I think, are important in making sure that as those organisations are developing their own thoughts, we're shaping them all the way through, so it's not just waiting until the last minute, but it's actually working together to make sure that we've used the investment pipeline that we've got in the strategic transport plan to shape those individual investments. And I think the relationship we've got already is very strong in that respect. And Chair, if I might just on that, also just remind members that we are coming to the end of our uh, looking at the investment programme as a whole and the benefits that that will bring not just in terms of economic, but social, health and well-being, and that will further strengthen the work that we can do with our individual partners, because it's recognising this investment is in a system that supports our communities and enables the business growth, and I think we're well prepared in that respect. So, uh, just to clarify some of the points, so the um, Councillor Robertson um, suggested that CP7, we actually brought that forward, the date, an earlier date than 2023, if that's possible. 
I think, Chair, we're doing that on an ongoing basis, so we will make sure that we have that as an ongoing dialogue. Excellent. And I think silo working is um, something that we all need to, to work hard and make sure that everybody's working together. And actually, I wonder if when we're doing sort of our stakeholder mapping, we need to think of other departments in government as well that we, we might want to get on board with the work that we're doing here. Um, so that, that's perhaps something we can take away and, and think about. If I might, Chair, I wonder whether I might invite Ben Smith from the department to, to comment, because I mentioned that we have these regular meetings with uh, the, the, the Director General. I just wonder, Ben, whether you might offer some sort of uh, observations about that, about how we can help with the silos. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, as you said, we had a, a first meeting um, of um, sort of senior representatives from uh, the subnational transport bodies, all of them, uh, which Martin represented Transport for the North um, last week uh, with my Director General, Emma Ward, uh, who looks after the Roads, Places and Environment group in the department. Uh, and I think um, we are extremely keen to make sure that we can support you uh, to make sure that you're sort of getting in touch with the right people across DFT and indeed wider across Whitehall um, from from time to time uh, as necessary as well. Um, my, my team in the department, the region, cities and devolution team, uh, is not modal. Uh, we do work across all modes and we work with the whole of the department. So we are well placed to, to help you with this. This is what we do uh, day in, day out. So um, please, do, uh, please do use us to, to help you with that. Um, but I completely agree it's important that uh, you're making the connections uh, and getting the uh, dialogue with the right people uh, that you need to be speaking to uh, in government. Um, just just quickly, whilst I've got the floor, if that's okay, and just to sort of obviously confirm that the department has received uh, Transport for the North's um, CSR um, proposals. Um, that has been fed into uh, the, 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 the spending review process. Uh, as you're probably aware, uh, the Treasury are planning to conclude that process um, towards the end of next month. Um, at the moment, there is a, a lot of discussion going on between all departments, uh, including uh, our own Department uh, for Transport uh, and the Treasury uh, to discuss all the bids that have gone into the, to the spending review um, process. Um, certainly, um, I know that the, uh, the bid does a good job, the TFN's bid does a good job of, of bringing out, uh, as, as you were saying earlier on, um, the importance of speaking with one voice across the North and the value that that can bring. And I know that uh, ministers in the department uh, are keen that that's exactly what, what TFN uh, and other STBs focuses on. Um, we will be uh, needing to sort of consider funding for subnational transport bodies in the round. Uh, so once we get a settlement from the Treasury, uh, we'll be needing to sort of work out what the picture looks like across all of the subnational transport bodies. And then we're obviously keen to come back to, to all of you um, as soon as we can uh, with, with an outcome on the allocations. Thank you for that update and thank you for attending here today and hope to see you at future meetings as well. Good to be here. Um, Councillor Hale. Yeah, um, I, I sort of share some of the uh, points raised by my Liverpool colleague and uh, um, you know what I'm going to raise in terms, of, in terms of the general submission. I was a bit disappointed when we talked about the things we could include, we didn't explicitly talk about the areas where there was potential for early wins, where it didn't involve land assembly, uh, purchasing major infrastructural works. And I would be talking about electrification from, certainly from our perspective, I know it's on the Northwest, there's areas as well, from the um, whole Selby, um, whole, whole, whole Sheffield. And um, what I would say was at 6.16, we've talked about the ability to drive for TFN to help drive down those drive efficiencies out and show that those perhaps those early wins could be delivered far cheaper than possibly government and um, sat with a sort of London perspective possibly um, could 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 realize on their own so I think we need to make more of the fact that there are areas that um, where early wins could be achieved and those costs that potentially could could be prohibitive if 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 allowed to escalate where where co-worked with TFN those costs could be driven out early wins could be achieved and we can make early starts in in areas such as ours because if we're serious about leveling up it's not just leveling up between uh, the south and the north it's making sure that nowhere in the north is left behind and uh, if you don't have an electrified railway you are certainly left behind so I just put that out there because it is mentioned in 6.16 I would have liked to have seen it indicated as and these could include like my Liverpool colleague I think referring to areas in Liverpool because it's clear that that there would be a, uh, an option for an early win for both government and ourselves on 
on areas which don't involve a lot of additional land assembly and uh, complex infrastructural work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hale. And I think those early wins are so important because it's actually proving that we can deliver and that we, you know, we have a plan. So, uh, Martin, did you want to comment on that at all? Uh, just to kind of reflect on, uh, I totally agree with the points being made by Councillor Hale. I think what we've attempted to set out in the document is um, we've already established ourselves as a track record of challenging costs, so we're focusing on delivering the outcomes. And I think that's one of the things that I'm keen that we build upon is that, um, that, uh, that reputation, if you like, of focusing on getting the outcomes, but making sure that we get the best value in, in, in achieving those outcomes. I'm certainly keen that we continue to work with all partners across the TFN area to make sure that we recognise and, and build upon those early wins. And it's certainly something that we'll continue to press uh, with the department and other bodies moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments on this paper? Okay, so the recommendation is that we note the SR21 submission to DFT and we provided comments which will go down in the, min the minutes of the meeting. So thank you for your contribution and thank you to the officers for producing the report. So, if we move on to item number eight, w which is the Strategic Transport Plan Development Programme. Martin, can you introduce this, please? Thank you. So, Chair, in the, uh, in the absence of <coughs> my colleague Tim Foster, who sends his apologies for uh, not being able to make it today, um, you have the report set out before you. Um, preparing, publishing and updating um, the Strategic Transport Plan is one of our statutory roles. Um, we published the Strategic Transport Plan in 2019. It seems appropriate to be beginning the process of updating that. Um, I want to make the point that I see this as being done in parallel with the need to update the independent economic review because um, the economy has always been the driver for our work in terms of the investment in transport. Uh, we're mindful that obviously we've seen changes in the business community over the last uh, 18 months um, driven by uh, external factors, but there have been changes there which we need to make sure we're being reflected in the economic review. The other document I want us to make sure we're linking into is the decarbonisation strategy because that is another powerful opportunity, both in terms of an economic opportunity as well as being an environmental necessity. So those two documents can help shape the work on the strategic transport plan. Uh, we've set out in the, in the covering paper the approach that we're proposing, uh, the timescale. Um, we would envisage uh, spending a lot of time in the next 12 to 18 months developing the evidence base, developing the uh, analytical side of it, and then recognising that we need to engage with the wider community across the north uh, to make sure that we're actually continuing to be uh, focused on what we should be doing through the strategic transport plan. Uh, Chair, you've, in the document, you've got in section four some of the key principles that we propose taking forward as part of the strategic transport plan. If members have any comments or observations on those at this stage, that would be very helpful. And then if members are content with the approach, this will become, if you like, a standing program within the work of TFN moving forward, which we will then monitor and report against through our regular reporting processes. Thank you, Martin. So clearly a very important um, process to move forward and the principles are shown on page 243. There's a number there in terms of the gu guiding principles to take the plan forward. Has anybody got any observations? Councillor Robinson first. Yeah, thanks, uh, Louise. And only kind of two sort of specific points from ourselves it very much kind of welcome this and I think kind of Martin hit the nail on the head actually when he referenced about how important decarbonisation is and, and frankly has raced much further up the agenda uh, than perhaps it was uh, in 2019 and quite rightfully so so we'd perhaps kind of pose the, the view that do we need to try and accelerate this work um, you know 2024 or it's best part of three years away. Uh, do we want to try and kind of pull that forward uh, to sort of make sure we've got a new STP in place in a shorter time period? And the second point that I wanted to raise as well is how are we going to make sure that the TFN STP dovetails with a lot of the kind of statutory local transport plans that most of the constituent areas will 
be having to go through the renewal process of. I know ours in the Liverpool City region is scheduled to be complete in 2023. So again, it's that point about that golden thread of, of making sure that kind of both at that constituent level and that sub-national level, it all kind of marries up and, and dovetails accordingly. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. And I think that the issue around the timing, I looked at 2024 and I thought, gosh, that's a long way away. And it's whether we can bring it forward, I think's really imp important, as is the engagement and, link, as you say, that golden thread that goes through everything. We are talking about setting up citizens' panels and stuff like that, and it would be good to get them involved uh, in this process. So if... Uh, I think everybody would be in, in, in agreement. The sooner we can get this brought together, and I, I would suggest perhaps for November we could look at the timings and come back with something that's a bit more ambitious um, so that we can get on and produce the, the plan. Um, OK. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, not wanting to lessen the ambition of uh, a strategic transport plan, because a clue's in the name there, um, but I think one of the principles that I think the business community would like to see um, is that some of the smaller schemes, which all of the constituent parts of TFN are involved in, uh, can have a disproportionately beneficial impact uh, locally, uh, just in terms of uh, economics as well, and I think that we shouldn't underestimate the potential of that as a principle, and I'd like to see that part of the general principles. Um, under 4.4, um, there is a comment also that about decoupling uh, decarbonisation from the economy. I think that's a dangerous route to go down. Uh, that's not to, to lessen the importance of decarbonisation, of course, uh, but if we decouple, then I think we weaken the arguments, particularly in terms of our ask to central government uh, for um, transport infrastructure investment. And I think the two can be uh, run hand in hand. They are not mutually exclusive. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And I think those small schemes that make a big difference are really important. And it goes back really to Councillor Hale talking about quick wins. Um, just signalling and things like that can make a, a really big um, difference. In terms of the, um, I was just looking at the wording of that. It's, can you, Martin, could you just explain what, what you were thinking? If necessary, we should be prepared to decouple economic growth from transport growth. I think it's the wording of decouple. Uh, definitely. Um, and, uh, and actually, if I can just also add my uh, reflections on that point about the, the importance of the linkage with the smaller schemes, I think that also comes back to Councillor Robinson's point that that's why the conversation with individual uh, authorities, and uh, whether they're MCAs or local transport authorities, is actually important because um, I'm clear that uh, our role as Transport for the North is to help with that strategic overview, but it's the connections, the onward local connectivity, which actually can be achieved through those smaller scale schemes, which are really uh, our opportunity to achieve um, perhaps a momentum in a way that we haven't thought about doing before. The, the, the point about decoupling here is, is, is really reflecting the fact that our um, we've seen changes in the way the business community operate and the way in which we as consumers get access to services and opportunities. At the moment, a lot of our work in terms of justifying schemes is the assumption that because you have more economic growth, you will inevitably have more movement in the traditional peak hours and therefore you need to invest in the traditional types of solutions. I think it's a little bit more sophisticated than that these days. Um, so yes, you will uh, see economic growth having more movement, but it may not be the type of movements that we've had before. It may actually about um, recognising that movements are actually spread out more evenly, and it's interesting to see um, recent conversations we've had with the train operators. The numbers on our trains in the north are back to pretty much what they were pre-COVID. But what's interesting is the pattern of that travel has changed. 
So you haven't necessarily got the same level of peak hour commuting, but a broader level of, of, of activity. Now, there's some interesting things there that we need to work with, and that's why I think the link with the independent economic review is so important to understand from a business perspective what do we need the transport system to do to achieve that growth, but to do it in a more sustainable way. So it's kind of just challenging some of our underlying assumptions at the moment, and if they still remain valid, that's fine, but I think there is an opportunity to do things differently moving forward. Thank you, Martin. Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this, I really welcome this work. Um, 2019, it was a different world. Uh, you know, we've got new MPs, new councils and new priorities. Um, I would be really, I think it'd be really useful exercise to actually map what the council's levelling up funds uh, bids have been, um, the active travel cities fund bids, and actually how do we integrate those kind of bids and support those bids in within our, our STP. Um, I, I've just done a little search on our entire meeting agenda, and we've not once referenced restoring your railways and that fund. Um, and I'd like, again, this is, this is money that I think we need to acknowledge and make sure that we try and get as much of that into into our constituent authorities as possible. Um, but I'd just, like to I'd just like to make sure that we factor in a few things. Firstly, uh, how do we integrate our transport system with ports? Obviously, in my neck of the woods, it's Hesham, Hesham Port, and from a decarbonisation perspective, uh, maritime and, and freight from a maritime perspective is actually a really carbon efficient way of getting things around. Um, how are we integrating it with our waste strategy? Um, there's obviously, that's an, another piece of emerging work from the government at the moment in terms of how do we try and get bin wagons off the roads and things like that. And I think it'd be useful for us to, to see the, our overall freight strategy. I'd like to see whether or not there's ways in which we can improve and decarbonise our waste and uh, refuse collection and, and disposal systems. Um, and also a massive plea to make sure that we include new and emerging economic projects um, university expansions in uh, in the beautiful town of Morecambe. We've got the Eden project uh, on our horizon, and how do we integrate our system to um, make sure that every single constituent authority in the room can come to Morecambe as quickly as they possibly can? Um, uh, but there's one final thing I'd like to just raise, which is in your programme of activity for this document um, on page two four eight. I think the most important line in the whole thing is the producing a you said we did exercise. I think that would be really useful for us to see, especially the newer members, to see exactly what was the impact of the first STP. What actually did we achieve from it? Because I think that will help us guide our thinking about how we want to then present STP2 to... to um, to government and stuff. So I think that would be a really useful piece of work that I'd like, I'd like to see as quickly as possible, really. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, and some important points raised there about um, the nimbleness of any plan, really, to be constantly updated and refreshed in terms of developments. Um, I know if, uh, Mayor Rotherham was here, he's very keen about links to ports, and I know you, that's part of the whole east-west connectivity um, and to get lorries off our roads is something that we've talked about at length actually that whole sort of freight strategy so you've raised some uh, really valid points there and I'm, I'm always one in favor of uh, we said you did I think it's um, so I think you know summarizing what we've already achieved would be would be good for uh, new members anyhow so that you've got a feeling of what's gone on in the past Martin did you want to add anything if I might, I, um, so uh, I, I will pick up on the point, uh, having uh, raised the point about the, uh, the programme and, and just uh, acknowledge the point you've made, uh, Chair, about uh, challenging ourselves on the timescale so that we get this done as quickly as possible and we will certainly take that away. I think the point that Councillor Edwards is making is really one to sort of just um, take note of that we need to think in terms of a, a systems approach increasingly when we're thinking about how do we support economic growth and how do we deliver decarbonisation. So if we want to get the best opportunities 
care of our transport system. We need to have the digital connectivity to enable the connections and the uh, whatever types of innovations coming. Uh, and of course, as we've seen on the example with um, some of the challenges on the East Coast Main Line recently, it's partly about the timetable, but it's actually also there's an issue about getting the right power supply so that the trains can run at the full speed. Now, these are all illustrations of how I think we can actually help, uh, as going back to a point made earlier, join up some of those agendas to achieve an outcome. We don't necessarily need to be in the lead of delivery, but making those linkages and being explicit about that so that it helps others to join us in delivering the outcomes that we're seeking, I think are really important. And it's just a reminder, uh, Chair, that at your previous meeting, which we did as a consultation call, you considered the freight and logistics strategy, which we will take out uh, for engagement. And that's an opportunity really to get into this, into this thinking about um, supply chains from the, to and from the, not just the ports, but our other global gateways into the distribution centres, and I'm sure um, there will be changes happening within the distribution centres as a consequence of some of the more recent challenges with the driver's market. You kind of get a sense, decarbonisation, uh, challenges with labour supplies. I, I suspect that the, the distribution companies are thinking about doing things differently in the longer term, and that's an opportunity that we need to build upon, because I think it would help us with the decarbonisation strategy as well as supporting the economy. Thank you very much, Martin. Councillor Hale. Just following on from the points that the colleague made over there in terms of, I think um, it is important that we, um, and I welcome the freight, um, the freight strategy, but as we've said many a time, in, you can't have half a freight route between Hull and Liverpool. You either have one or you don't have one. And um, if you're having one, it's got to be electrified. I'll make that point again, because obviously if you don't electrify to to hold for passengers, you don't electrify to hold docks for, for freight either. So again, um, and I think people will, well, wait, with the lorry driver shortage, people will wake up and think again uh, for economic necessity, if not for the right, always the right reasons, um, about the way in which we have to move around our goods and services. The only point I would make also, following on from the points that were made here and here, was the, the issue about making sure that, although this is a strategic document, it does link between um, the local authorities' plans around things like active travel that Dan Jarvis normally mentions when he's here about um, um, and that, because I'll give you a really good example. Was um, We have a big LEP cycling route between us and one of our commuter towns, um, and that's to encourage modal shift. But that also has uh, the alternative way when you're not perhaps on a bike or on a bus is on a train. So there's no point us doing that if we then cut the rail services between town A and town B because we will not encourage modal shift. We will actually just discourage modal shift. So it will, I mean, it will actually undermine the, the active travel proposal which we've got let funding to achieve. So, so it, it is all very connected in what we do and we have to make sure that there are, there are synergies between those local authority plans and those perhaps cross area, cross, area, cross combined authority plans and, um, and what... TFN is proposing and what we and what we influence via the franchising routes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hale. And I think that also includes cross border as well. Um, I couldn't be here today and not mention connectivity with Wales. So um, I think it's that whole picture that we need to look at all the time. Um, so uh, d does anybody else want to contribute to the discussion? Yes. Thank you, uh, Chair. Just to say um, two quick things from the Department's perspective. Uh, the first of which is, um, obviously, we're already working with you on the development of the, of the next strategic transport plan and want to continue to do that and help you to uh, develop that into, uh, uh, into the, the, the next sort of plan. Um, very much that, that work is in line with what ministers see as the top priority for subnational transport bodies, uh, that is setting a transport strategy for the region, for the north, uh, and providing advice to ministers on prioritisation. So I think this work dovetails in very nicely with that. And just the second thing to say is that we have uh, been discussing um, with, uh, with Martin and, and indeed with the other STBs uh, some areas where um, we think that STBs can help uh, ministers in the department in particular areas, uh, and those four areas are um, decarbonisation, 
Commission, which obviously uh, members have been discussing, um, delivering on our bus back better commitments uh, on buses, uh, rolling out um, electric vehicle infrastructure uh, and supporting local authority capability. So I would sort of uh, encourage you to sort of have a think about all of those as you develop uh, the next STP. Thanks. Thank you. Um, anybody else like to contribute? So there's been some really uh, important points raised there, some common themes, I think, from right across the country, uh, right across the north. Um, so hopefully Martin's made a note of all of those. And what I'm asking you to do today are the recommendations at two, which is to agree the proposed programme to develop and consult and agree a new STP by should we say date to be clarified because we have got 2024 but i think there's a feeling we'd like to perhaps bring that slightly forward so if we could um have a look at the dates again with that martin uh, chair if you leave it um if, if members are comfortable that we've 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 reckoned we've acknowledged the fact that you've asked us to challenge our own timetable and i think in an earlier um was a comment chair you asked us to come back to you at the next meeting i think that would be very timely because there will be a whole plethora of announcements between now and the 24th of november and i think coming back to you as a body with that in the round will actually be the right time to do that Thank you, um, everybody. So 2.2 uh, .2 is the principles outlined in section four. Has everyone agreed to those recommendations? Yes, nodding and agreeing, that's, so that's carried. Thank you very much. The next item is item number uh, nine, which is the rail review reform matters responding to the white paper. David um, Hogarth, welcome. You've been hiding at the back there, so I was, I was a bit worried about where you got to. So thank you. Could you introduce this? Thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah, just a, a few words of introduction on this, if I, if I may. At the last uh, discussion on this, which was back in June, you asked us to develop a more detailed response to the white paper uh, that had come out in, uh, in May this year and a case for change as to how this would work and we could push further devolution uh, and local accountability in the north. So we presented the case for change today in the paper. It's already been reviewed by Rail North Committee and Scrutiny Committee earlier in the month, and they were content with the broad uh, approach uh, set out. At the last meeting, there were some concerns about the lack of positive references around the role of strategic transport bodies in the future of the rail industry structure. But I'm pleased to say that we've had some very positive discussions um, in, in three main areas, really, since the last meeting, uh, and that's with uh, the transition team, particularly dealing with the, uh, the development of the new 30-year whole industry strategy plan. So that very much ties in with our strategic transport plan you've just been, been talking about. We've also been specifically talking to Network Rail about how this all works in the north and the team that are working very closely with Andrew Haynes leading on that work at Network Rail. And finally, we've been talking to DFT about the Rail North Partnership, which is uh, the first part of devolution we already have in the north, about how we can build on that. So uh, we're very reassured that we are progressing all of those, all of those aspects. So the paper sets out um, the case for change really in, in four key areas, which are set out as four pillars. And I think just to emphasize some of those, the offer here is that TFN and its members will be a strategic partner for GB railways in the north of England. And that's really important that it's not just us having things done to us and given uh, options and choices. We actually want to be a partner and we can be a strategic partner for the north. Uh, we would also lead on the multimodal strategy for the north as a whole, tying back to the strategic transport plan, as we talked about, and lead very much on evidence and data uh, and that underpinning economic evidence we, we've talked about as well. And finally, and very importantly, we can be the unified voice for both the northern authorities and the northern businesses working with the LEPs, uh, as we do, and facilitating local devolution um, in local areas and pushing uh, helping to push that forward where, where local areas have got specific plans around that. So we highlighted some of the good work that Rail North Partnership and ourselves did, for example, in the aftermath of May 2018, uh, pushing for a better solution and sorting out the reliability issues, but also the work during, during, co during COVID. Oppor opportunities to collaborate more on decarbonisation with our strategy out there. 
and obviously our ambitions for smart ticketing, pay as you go in the north could be a really strong pilot area, even though we don't have uh, the specific uh, IST project that we had uh, last year. The ambitions remain and we know the proposals are out there linking in with things like local authority bus strategies uh, in particular as well. We also previously made the case for Northern Route um, Network Rail at the time, but GB Railways in this context, uh, that case still stands. It was referenced in the white paper, uh, but really in the context of post-NPR, uh, we think that could be done a lot earlier as part of the reform as well. So that's highlighted in the paper. At Rail North Committee, members did highlight the importance of cross-border uh, services and working with other strategic transport bodies, which we're already doing and we'll continue to uh, have discussions with them as well. And uh, I think given the positive discussions that we've had with the transition team with Network Rail, what we're actually proposing is, is rather than just sort of present this as a thing we'd like, um, we're actually proposing that we work collaboratively with the transition team and with Network Rail to develop this into uh, a more detailed proposition of how this would work in the north and use our document, our proposition, as, as really our starting point for what we would like. So the response from Network Rail and the transition team is, is very positive to that idea and uh, we propose that we therefore do that work and bring back a joint uh, report to the November board chair. Excellent. Um, it sounds all very good, this. Um, and uh, I think, Martin, you'd like to add a few words, wouldn't you? It's just to, I know we have colleagues from Network Rail here today, but when I uh, caught up with Sir Peter Hendy and Andrew Haynes um, a couple of weeks ago, um, it was very clear that they want to work with us. Um, they see the opportunity to use what we're doing in the uh, in the north as an opportunity to maybe realise some of those benefits from the, the rail reforms sooner rather than later. Uh, and I would say, uh, Chair, that Knowing the individuals in the transition team as I do, they get the importance of a strategic approach alongside the national picture. Uh, and the one thing that we're quite, uh, I think we're well placed as a region to help with uh, is this idea of, of actually, this is an opportunity for double devolution. If I look at Councillor Robinson, we've got uh, in Mersey Rail, we've got uh, uh, that very clear working example of how devolution at a local level can lead to success. And I think that would be probably an aspiration for many of our uh, uh, combined authority areas. So we've got some track record that we can build, but then we've got this voice in TFN to knit that together. So I think we are well placed. Um, I don't know whether colleagues from Network Well want to comment further, but I know that Sir Peter and Andrew are both very keen that we kind of move forward on this in partnership. Does anyone from Network Well want to make any comments? You're welcome to add to this positive discussion. Thanks, Chair. Um, Martin, you're closer to the conversations with Sir Peter and Andrew Haynes than myself, so I've, I've got nothing I can add to that, I'm afraid. OK, sorry to drag you down okay. to say that. You could have shouted from the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, members, open now to um, comment and observation. So, uh, Mayor Driscoll, um, oh, we've got quite a few, so start with Mayor Driscoll first. Thank you, Chair. Very much like to echo Martin's points. The, the value of the capacity that TFN brings to this to help us unify. We, we all have a common cause on a great number of issues here, so that's very welcome. Very pleased to hear the recognition of not just cross-border, but also, let's be honest, union connectivity. Um, you've mentioned yourself, Chair, about Wales. We border Scotland, and I know um, Councillor Little and I have had discussions about uh, working together with Scotland, because our trains do go through, um, as well as our roads and other services. Um, and just to keep mindful of that point you make, um, which I think was well phrased as double devolution, because many of us do have ambitions around a wonderfully integrated transport system in our, our city regions or joint transport committee areas or, or localities. Um, and that's an evolving picture in and of itself. And uh, I think there's, there's certainly a way through, but it's going to be one that will require a little bit of attention to be sensitive to local needs as well as the pan-northern needs. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Mayor Driscoll. Um, do you want to make any comments on that? No? OK. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, D David mentioned in his uh, introduction to the paper about the voice of business being uh, important in, in this. Um, so I think it's, it's more a question of language, really. One of the fourth, the fourth pillar in the paper refers to uh, TFN as a, a unified voice for northern authorities acting as a link between local devolution integration and G GBR. Now, I, I, I just think we should highlight uh, the fact that it is also a voice of business um, so that, that it adds additional credibility to what TFN is about. And I know, I know it's, it, it's implicit in everything that, that we do and say, but I, I think we should be a bit more explicit about it. Thank you. I think, is everyone happy that we change that fourth pillar to include businesses as well? I, I think that's sensible. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, there's a, Peter, did you want to come on? Then I'll come to Councillor Robinson and then uh, Edwards. It's just supplementary to, to the observations uh, there, which is that um, can we have a look at all the pillars? Because I think they are, pillar two, for example, refers to local authorities. Um, we've all seen Greek temples with no roof because the pillars weren't, the pillars weren't strong enough. Um, we have got very strong pillars in one north, including business. So I, I think we should just have a look at all those four pillars again. So the, um, I think the, uh, it's, it's only the fourth one, isn't it? Because the number one is Transport for the North as a strategic partner for Great British Railways. Uh, Transport for the North as the lead on multimodal strategy and investment priorities. Transport for the North as the provider of evidence, data and strategic insights. And I have to say that's a real strength that we have here, some really talented uh, officers within the team, and then Transport for the North as a unified voice for Northern Authorities businesses. Yeah. Um, sorry, Chair. Uh, the second pillar uh, may have that initial wording. It then says working closely with local authority partners. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, we can add it into that. It's just not, it's at uh, 2.1 at the recommendations, it's not shown there, but no, we'll ad ad adapt that later on. Um, okay, Councillor Robinson. Yeah, th thanks very much. And can I sort of start by warmly commending David and all the team for all the hard work that's, that's gone into to this, because it's absolutely vital that we kind of, you know, very thoroughly engage with this process to get the very best deal for the north of England and its railways and all the communities that it serves uh, long into the, into the future. I think sort of there's certain elements in here kind of uh, particularly warmly welcome, particularly that focus around getting the geography right uh, on all of this and making sure that we do accelerate a northern route within a reformed uh, railway. I think a number of us have always had concerns that if you have railway geography which is based on arterial routes in and out of London, which is really important, don't misunderstand me, all our links down to the south are, are vital. Um, that often leads to a focus that's more on the southern ends of those routes than actually kind of the focuses around particularly infrastructure that we need to see here in the north of England. So very much kind of warmly uh, and strongly welcome that focus on uh, the delivery of a, a northern route as part of, of this. Equally, uh, fully kind of endorse all Martin's points about the principle of double devolution. Um, you know, I think what we've got here as response is great, and perhaps we want to kind of pull out as best pra practice examples not only what we do with Mersey Rail, but also the structures that exist in the northeast as ones that we want to go further on in our areas, but also, where possible, replicate in other parts of the north. I know there's enthusiasm in lots of different parts of the north to have something that's a more devolved uh, settlement at a more localised level within that TFN umbrella. Um, and one point I do want to raise that I think we haven't captured in the response, and I do think it's important that we do do that, is actually how rolling stock is provided. Um, there are opportunities around um, the Williams Shapps review. There are also risks. And one of my great fears is if you read the white paper, 
it seems to assume that the existing rolling stock leasing market is going to remain untouched. Now, I'll be dead direct about it. If we want to get the best value railway for the taxpayer, the travelling public and of all of our economies, we've got to drive out analogous costs. And one of the biggest analogous costs in the railway is an unregulated rolling stock leasing market. And at the very least, it needs kind of regulating strongly. I actually prefer a direct procurement model that we're following in the Liverpool City region because we've been able to show that by doing that, it's a third cheaper. Uh, in fact, it's a model that we're using. I know Tyne and we're using exactly the same for the, the uh, Tyne and we're Metro as well. So I really think it's important that whilst that's not just a northern issue, that's a UK-wide issue, we strongly put that back to, uh, to government because if we want to get the maximum bang for our buck and deliver the best services for the travelling public, we have to drive out analogous costs and the rolling stock leasing market is in, uh, probably the best example of that in the railway at this moment in time. Excellent point, um, Councillor Robinson, and that's something we can look at, how we can take that forward. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what is the proposed governance structures within Great British Railways? Will there be a board and will TFN have a seat on that board? Can anyone, can you answer, David? I can only answer by saying I don't think we know that yet, and that's something we'll certainly engage with the transition team on. Um, what I do know is there's quite a lot of focus at DFT side at the moment on the structural setup and the legislation that's needed, so I'd imagine that will cover all of that, and they're working through, through that this autumn, but um, I certainly haven't seen any... Uh, any more on that. What we have done is, is said um, we want to play a role in the uh, advisory bodies that are being set up for um, establishing uh, Great British Railways uh, and you know we and the other strategic transport bodies would have a, a lot to a lot to bring to that. Uh, and hopefully if a report comes back in November, a joint report that can be part of that report with a bit more clarity. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody? Oh, Councillor Scott. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I agree, obviously, it's very important that all the local authorities are consulted on this. But just to make the point which I made at the Rail North Committee, at the moment, the Tees Valley Combined Authority are considering its position on potential local rail devolution and obviously uh, await further details, hopefully, which we're going to get in the levelling at white paper later this year. But as I say, we're still considering it, but I do accept that we do have to work together for connectivity. But, uh, you know, we haven't uh, got our real position on this as yet. Thank you, Councillor Scott, and we'll note those comments. Thank you. Anybody else want to contribute? Okay, so the recommendations, the three of them are at section two. Everybody happy with that? Agreed? We agreed with those? Good, and look forward to the report that will come back in November, an update. Um, item number 10 is the next one, which is the Rail North Committee feedback. Um, David, are you giving us some, an update on this? Yes, thanks, Joe. I can give a brief uh, update. Um, obviously, we have Councillor Robinson here who chaired the, uh, chairs the committee meeting as well. He may want to add. Um, obviously, we've talked about the white paper, so I won't, uh, I won't cover that. That was one of the main items at the, at the committee. We then had an update on the Manchester area services and infrastructure, which I know is a, a particularly uh, hot topic at the moment um, for much of the north. So... The committee heard that there have been good progress on improving on the original uh, timetable proposal that came out of the, the task force in a number of key areas. Um, progress on developing a, a road map or rail map, setting out um, how we move away from that 2022 uh, timetable proposal, bearing in mind that that has some connectivity downsides to it. Um, although it does, it is designed to deliver a more more reliable service in the absence of the infrastructure being in place to allow all the services to operate, and we also heard that good progress has been made on a, 
a new form of collaboration between Transport for North and the Department for Transport to really link together the infrastructure and service changes so they go in lockstep in, in future and make sure that uh, there's joint oversight really of that, of that work, so working with uh, the Department for Transport and ministers in the, in the department. So the next steps really on that are, um, first, first, first thing to happen will be uh, the consultation report from phase one that was earlier in the year will be published, which will give a di general direction uh, of travel. And we hope that will be alongside the, uh, the new collaboration that we've developed with the department. And then later in the autumn, the train operators will do a more detailed phase two consultation where they've actually got the detailed timetables for people to, uh, to comment on uh, and there's still time for them to make, uh, make changes to some of the detailed calling patterns and so on as a result of that second consultation. We also had uh, an operational update as normal at the committee and uh, we had uh, some future timetable changes in there. Um, talking about the need to uh, continue, train operators continue to be agile to the current demand levels in the post-COVID recovery. So we heard Martin mention that there is fairly strong recovery, good recovery of demand in the north, uh, but it isn't necessarily in the, in the same places that it was at the same times for, for 2019. So how we can keep that timetable development uh, planning uh, agile to that so that we actually get into a position where um, we're not only delivering uh, more benefits for passengers, but also getting in more, more revenue to make the railway more sustainable, uh, which is always the plan for the investment-led uh, franchises that we had and has obviously been, uh, been slightly uh, knocked off course by, uh, by COVID. Um, there were some concerns raised about some of the future timetables, as, as Councillor Hain, Hale uh, mentioned earlier on. Uh, the action there was uh, Northern Rust to keep those proposals under review. They did confirm um, that the, uh, the services in question on the whole Bridlington line will come back in full in May next year. That's already built into the, uh, uh, the, the timetable construct. And they also offered a, a separate discussion with, uh, with authorities on that, which we can certainly, uh, we can certainly follow up. We, there was also an update on the East Coast mainline services, which um, is, I think, a really good example of where the North come together with one voice, really strong response to that consultation, which we're able to back up with some, some clear evidence and, and really that kind of economic need uh, and social need on top of the, uh, the more kind of operational and, and revenue focus that the uh, proposals had. So the upshot of that is the uh, timetable is on uh, hold, was to be implemented in May 2022, probably May 23 at the earliest. We're, we're now working through with operators and the industry some options that we will be discussing further with the Round North Committee in the next uh, month or so, I hope, as to how uh, we can get a better outcome uh, for the North and, uh, and the rest of that route as well. There are some other items on business planning and some the constitutional changes that you've seen earlier on, which I won't, I won't go into now, but hopefully that's a, a good summary of the uh, main points of the committee. Yeah, that's, and, and thanks for, for all the work of Rail North Committee. Uh, Councillor Robinson, did you want to add anything as the chair of the committee? I, I will very briefly, yeah, um, just to sort of emphasise the, the point about kind of the Manchester Recovery Task Force uh, process, and, and thank the DFT for the, the joint engagement uh, that we've had in that process to actually kind of move the issue forward. I think from our perspective, the most important element, though, is that kind of, well, I think we call it rail map uh, forward of how we actually come up with the long term infrastructure solution for central Manchester, because that's absolutely vital uh, at the end of the day that we can fix that buckle in the belt, if, I, if I'll call it that, of the existing railway to allow us to put all those services back in that we will require and also add more in the, in the future. So I think we're, we're kind of looking forward to uh, hopefully very soon uh, getting an indicative uh, view of that rail map because that really is the, the most important piece of work over the months and years ahead to fix that infrastructure and give us the, the ability to put much more services back in and more into the future. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Uh, Councillor Hale. Yeah, um, I mean, the point I made earlier, um, I make no apologies for making it again. If you are not on the North, Rail North Committee, this report gives us no information about what is happening in our area. And whilst I, I appreciate we have got back on the horse, so to speak, uh, because we found out of the, about some major changes between, and I'd be careful what I say, because I'm sure we're open and these are not agreed as yet, but 
we did find out about proposed changes between ourselves in Hull and, um, and therefore affecting all our East Riding stations and, um, and Manchester. We, didn't, we weren't consulted, we found out and we happened to then have some input into it. It's not acceptable for major, major changes to franchising to, to almost be, uh, for us as a major city, to be oblivious to it. And that's before I get on to Hull to Bridlington. We are not a city with trams. We're a city with, without a PTE, and therefore we have rural bus services in East Riding. So that our major, trans, our major modal transit route between ourselves and our commuter towns and our, and our suburbs is, is the rail. And proposals to literally decimate the services between us and our, you know, and effectively choke our city centre economy, we haven't been consulted on. We've not formally been consulted on at all, nor have our colleagues in the East Riding. Partly whether that goes to the Rail North Committee and therefore we're not sitting on it and we therefore, and therefore people who don't have any skin in the game are giving a view for, for ourselves, I don't know, but that's not acceptable. And I'm sorry, um, and, I, I, and you know, I, the East Riding feel exactly the same um, about the fact that major changes, to, we, we can't talk about levelling up and then, um, and the desire to have one north and then decisions be taken. That, and I'll be quite honest, that does benefit other areas around this table because you would get that surplus, um, you know, those additional routes and we would lose some. And, and there has to be a full and frank discussion about that that we're involved in and not just finding out about after and then feeding into the process. We have to be formally consulted as a local authority and I speak on behalf of ourselves and my East Riding colleagues on this because we're, we're not happy and you probably can tell that and I just put it out there because um, we've always been f felt fully part of this organisation but on this issue we feel that we've um, you know we've had less say than when the franchise is privately run and it's something that we need to resolve. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hale, I think it's a really important point. I know it happened to us in Cheshire West with some um, services from Chester in the past. So I think it's a challenge to Martin, I think, of how we can ensure that um, people who don't sit on the Rail North Committee are consulted and have an opportunity to input into that discussion. Um, it could be that it's visiting members can attend and discuss it, but we just need to think, join up those dots a little bit so no one's left behind. So, sorry, Chair, I should have said, uh, I lost it towards the end, I apologise, was the, I do want a formal, we were asking from Hull and the East Running that there is a formal review of those services between Hull and Brillington, and certainly I think we're back on tr track with David's people in terms of, uh, and the, and the franchises between Hull and Manchester, and we've suggested alternatives, but but in Hull and Bridlington, it's not acceptable to ourselves in both authorities. Thanks. So that's a, a challenge back to you, Martin, to do some joined up work there. Um. And if I may, um, Chair, just to say that we, we I think you, um, in the earlier debate, uh, when Councillor Hale raised the point about the representation on the Rail North Committee, you charged us with us to go away and review that and, and make sure that we address that issue. Thank you. So I've got Councillor uh, Mackenzie and then Councillor Hannigan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a couple of points on behalf of North Yorkshire County Council to the operational update uh, that David Hogarth has just given us. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, the East Coast mainline timetable changes, in, which were planned for 2022, have now been postponed, and we're very pleased about that. Uh, and, and we thank uh, Transport for the North, who, who added to our own uh, response to say that uh, the, the proposed changes would have meant uh, some uh, disadvantages for travellers, rail travellers, both to and from North Allerton, which is actually where county, our county hall is, uh, and would actually have affected rather badly uh, our own employees. So we're glad that that has been postponed, and we're very grateful to TFN again for helping us to speak with one voice and being very effective. Uh, also in 3.7, mention is made of the additional York to Harrogate services, and this is something I did mention at the Rail North Committee earlier this month. Uh, this uh, improvement is actually a doubling of services. It's a very, very good and rare improvement, I would say, uh, to rail services, uh, increased from one, the proposal is from December, from one uh, train in each direction uh, to two trains in each direction every hour. It's a very busy rail line and it's a part of the uh, of North Yorkshire and York which is growing very rapidly but I would like to mention also the contribution from the North Yorkshire LEP and I know Matthew is here from the North Yorkshire LEP because they contributed to 
the rail upgrade that had to be undertaken in order for that frequency to be increased. And between us, we put in £10 million investment in that rail line. And as a result of that, uh, the, uh, in, in track and signalling, uh, it was possible, therefore, for Northern to introduce this doubling of service. So uh, my thanks to TFN. My thanks also to the North Yorkshire LEP. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, Councillor Hannigan. Uh, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to challenge Councillor Hale's uh, point, point about consultation, <clears throat> particularly with these uh, changes to uh, the Bridlington uh, to Hall service. Um, but, but I think it has to be said that officers do communicate on a regular basis in terms of changes that have been made. Uh, when those changes are known to them. And, and it has to be said that I, uh, I, I did object vociferously to the, uh, to, to the changes being made to the Bridlington line because, as Councillor Hale points out, uh, c connectivity between the East Riding towns and the City of Hull is not good. And any loss of uh, railway services, be it seasonal or otherwise, is, is, is actually unacceptable. So, 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 so I accept that point. Uh, and, and consultation does need to improve. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, does anybody else want to contribute to this um, discussion? Oh, sorry, Hans. Councillor Mundy, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think we find ourselves in a situation and a very difficult job that the Transport of the North Board had to, had to deal with is the, uh, the timetable. We ended up playing around with timetable changes and from Warrington's, from Warrington's situation, Warrington, Manchester and, and Liverpool all lose. And it's simply because the, uh, the actual investment in infrastructure hasn't taken place. So in, in Warrington, I think we wanted to turn, turn around stations there so we, we could in, actually improve and actually benefit from the economic recovery and the economic, even economic growth. It, the, the possibilities are there, but they're taken away because the, inf the infrastructure hasn't been invested in. And I think the lack of uh, even a timetable, even at this, this stage now, there's still no timetable to uh, get any shovels on, on the floor to actually deliver the, the uh, improvements to the services that we need. And it's infrastructures all over that's needed there can, can address all these problems. But instead, we sit around and have, a, and have a difficult job of trying to play around with the, uh, the timetables to try to make sure everyone, no one's actually gaining from it. We lose less. And say, actually, in a time when we're trying to... Uh, have an economic recovery and a levelling up situation, we're all losing. So in the north, everybody loses, and, it's, and it comes down to we haven't, we haven't actually, or there's been no investment in the proper investment in the infrastructure, which we could see these problems. We've all identified how to solve them, but it does need a bit of, in, a bit of funding in there and getting the jobs done rather than playing around with uh, timetables, which nobody actually wins, nobody gains from it. And I think that it actually drags us back, not takes us forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Mundy. Um, Martin, do you want to... Oh, we, OK, David, did you want to come back? Well, just, just to say, I think, I think the infrastructure point is, is really well made, and that's the purpose of the rail map, um, to link all this together. It's probably worth saying um, a couple of the points, uh, the Warrington point and, obviously, Councillor Hale's point about Hull to Manchester services are related to that, and the Manchester point. The, the Bridlington line service is more a COVID uh, resource issue. We're still in that post-COVID issue where not all services are able to run and there are resource constraints in different parts of the uh, of, of the north uh, so i think on that one we'll we'll certainly take that point on and uh, uh, arrange a, a follow-up call with the operator with rail north partnership and east riding and, and hull so we get to, to get a response on that thank you very much for that if I can make one sort of uh, plea almost to the members, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the importance of rail and we've talked a couple of times today about how passenger numbers have actually really bounced back and um, talking to some of the operators, as I mentioned earlier, um, when you get to the leisure market, we're actually in some instances uh, above the level of passengers that we had pre-COVID. And I just worry um, sometimes, um, dare I say it, that those who are looking at the finances of of the railways, look at it from a London and the South East perspective. Um, you know, if you look at the market in the commuters in the London and South East, they may not be back in the same way. Uh, it may be seen by those in London that, you know, the rail market still got 
come up to the north and you will see that we've got that demand back. And if going back to the point that uh, Council Monday is making, actually it's investing in growth, which is going to deliver economic opportunities, which actually will increase revenues, which actually reduces the burden on the taxpayer. So I think um, my plea to all the members of TFN is actually we need to get that message out that the rail network in, in the north is actually thriving and is starting to struggle again because of the success we've got. Thank you, Martin. Um, anybody else, or should we move um, on to the recommendation, is to note the report? Everyone in favour? Yep, agreed. Um, and the final item this morning is item 11, the Corporate Risk Register report. Ian, could you introduce this, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a six-monthly um, report to the Board. It's actually, as, mentioned, as Chris Melling mentioned in his annual Audit and Governance Committee update, it's a standing item at the Audit and Governance Committee, so it's, it's reviewed at each of their meetings. Um, in discussion with Audit and Governance, there has been a, a change in the format of this report since the last time you saw it back in March, so hopefully that will make it easier for members to, to engage with and to use. Um, we set out in the report a number of the, the key changes that have been made in the various risks or have occurred in the various risks since the last report. I'd say at a macro level there's probably two things that are apparent. One is that there have been some reductions um, in risk levels for some of the corporate risks, but those are generally where we've got control over the mitigations or we are delivering things that are essentially operational. I think it's fair to say that there's still considerable levels of risk out there that are related to uncertainty of one form or another that we face, either um, economic and pandemic related or policy related, um, often as a result of, of the pandemic. So the overall risks that Transport for the North face are still quite considerable, as you'll better see from the report. But I'd be um, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ian. Has anybody got any questions or observations on the risk register? No? Um, so we're happy with the recommend... Oh, sorry, Councillor... Uh, Mayor Driscoll. Thank you. This... Not so much on the report, but on, on the very high risk of Northern Powerhouse Rail, the integrated rail plan. Um, we all have common cause in wanting better transport for the North, and we work very well cross-party. So it's just a request for the minority members to do all you can through political channels, please, to, and I know you will be, but you know, you will have my full support and I'm sure everybody else's full support to do this in as a, an effective and strategic way as possible to make that case on behalf of the North. Let's work together on this. Thank you, Mayor Driscoll, and I, I would reiterate that one of the things we've talked about is getting all our MPs in the North on board for this so that they can do some lobbying and work for us in, in Parliament as well. So I think that's part of Martin's plan in terms of that getting stakeholders on board to support us. But yes, I'd agree with that. Um, it's important for all of us. Uh, anybody else want to add anything or any comments? Okay, so recommendations at two, we agreed with those? Smashing. Um, and that's the final item on the agenda. There is no any other business unless someone's got something urgent they wish to raise. No? Okay, well, I'll draw this meeting to a close. Uh, thank you all very much for attending and those people who've watched online. And uh, we have the partnership board at two o'clock, which will be held in private. So um, hopefully I'll see some of you in the room there later on. Thank you very much.